The Senator from Rhode Island. President, you have just heard uh, two colleagues make convincing and passionate arguments for putting a price on carbon, the central protection from climate crisis. A price on carbon, like we propose, would dramatically lower emissions and put us on a net zero by 2050 path, the path necessary to avoid the worst climate chaos. Because it's a price on pollution, we can dial it up or dial it down as climate chaos worsens or abates. Because our proposal is border adjustable, it would let American industry compete, even in countries without a price on carbon. And because our plan is revenue neutral, all the funds go back to the American people in the form of payroll tax credits, social security or VA benefits, or grants to states to navigate this transition. So if our plan is so good, you'd think it might already be on its way to becoming law. You'd think there might be Senate committee hearings on it. You'd think there might be bipartisan negotiations. Well, none of the above. And to understand why that's taking place, you've got to look at who's supporting carbon pricing and who's opposed. So let's start with the good news. Who is supporting it? Earlier this year, 27 winners of the Nobel Prize in economics, 27 Nobel Prize winning economists, 15 former chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, more than half of them marked here in red Republican, four chairs of former chairs of the Federal Reserve, half of them Republican, and two Treasury secretaries, including a Republican, in the Wall Street Journal, no less endorsed a border adjustable price on carbon with revenues returned to the American people. In other words, a carbon price very like our bill. Even the patron saint of conservative economists, the late Milton Friedman, himself also a Nobel Prize winner, made the case that it is proper under conservative economics for government to put a price on pollution. The best way to do it, he said, is to impose a tax on the cost of the pollutants and make an incentive for manufacturers and for consumers to keep down the amount of that pollution. Four former Republican administrators of the Environmental Protection Agency, four Presidents Nixon and President Reagan and both President Bushes, advocated for a price on carbon in the New York Times. There is burgeoning support in the business community. In May, dozens of companies with a combined market cap of nearly $2.5 trillion came to Congress to advocate for a price on carbon. CEOs of 13 major corporations recently announced the formation of the CEO Climate Dialogue to do the same. Now, all these CEOs and corporations may be responding to an explosion of warnings coming from economic regulators here and abroad, national banks here and abroad, government agencies here and abroad, and risk analysts who do this kind of thing professionally, that we are headed for economic perils if climate change is not addressed with an effective, predictable remedy, like a price on carbon emissions. Last month, even Pope Francis convened a two-day summit at the Vatican on climate change, where he urged governments, businesses, and oil companies to get serious about climate change and to follow carbon pricing as the smart path forward, calling it essential, essential. And by the way, to do a little moral uh, wander here, Pope Francis is not alone among religious leaders in seeing the moral imperative to solving this problem. The head of the Church of England said, reducing the causes of climate change is essential to the life of faith. It is a way to love our neighbor and to steward the gift of creation. 232 evangelical pastors from 44 states declared love of God, love of neighbor, and the demands of stewardship are more than enough reason for evangelical Christians to respond to the climate change problem with moral passion and concrete action. 
43 rabbis from around the world stated that Jewish teachings mandate that we do everything possible to help avert a climate catastrophe and other environmental disasters and to help shift our imperiled planet onto a sustainable path. Likewise, leaders and scholars of the Islamic, Hindu, and Buddhist faiths have urged climate action, including pricing carbon. So with all this support, particularly from so many Republicans, you'd think that carbon pricing would be a no-brainer, that we'd be already at work here in Congress, that we'd be doing something. Unfortunately, if you thought that, you would be wrong. And the bad news is who's opposed to carbon pricing and what dirty tools they bring to that job. Here's one example. Last month, hints of interest appeared from a few House Republicans in carbon pricing. And suddenly, an open letter appeared opposing carbon pricing. The letter was signed by all these entities, lots and lots of entities with happy sounding names like Americans for Tax Reform, Americans for Prosperity, Citizens Against Government Waste, such nice names. You might think that this letter represents grassroots popular opposition to carbon pricing. You would be wrong. These groups have a common identifier. They keep their funding sources secret. But skilled investigative journalists and researchers who spent countless hours digging through corporate tax filings and other documents have unearthed the funders. And guess what? The vast majority of these groups are funded with fossil fuel money. They are front groups. They are not real. We actually added it up. And the groups behind this letter received collectively over half a billion, that's with a B, half a billion dollars from groups linked to the fossil fuel billionaire Koch brothers, Exxon Mobil, the American Petroleum Institute, and other fossil fuel interests. It's a complete front. Half a billion dollars is a lot, but remember, that's just what the researchers could find. Because these front groups hide their funding so well, the true number is probably several times that, probably billions of dollars. It sounds disgusting, doesn't it? An industry hiding behind front groups to spend billions of dollars to gum up a remedy to our climate crisis? But why wouldn't the fossil fuel industry spend a few billion dollars to block climate action here in Congress? The annual U.S. subsidy for fossil fuel was most recently estimated by the International Monetary Fund at $650 billion. Against that fat annual subsidy, spending a few billion is just a rounding error. Look at one example from this flotilla of phony front group signatories. Americans for Tax Reform, with its president, Grover Norquist who claim to represent the regular taxpayer. Hogwash. Americans for Tax Reform has received over $5 million from Coke-linked groups, K-O-C-H, not Coca-Cola, Coke Industries, the big fossil fuel company, and over $800,000 from the American Petroleum Institute. They are hired guns, and they're wearing masks, so you don't know who's paying them. And that group is just one tentacle of the fossil fuel climate denial apparatus. They've even taken over the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers and turned those general business groups into fossil fuel zombies on climate change. It's time to say enough. I ask my colleagues to please take a sincere look at climate change and carbon pricing and look at who is saying what? On one side, you have the moral authority of the great religions. You've got bipartisan agreement of the world's best economists. You've got lots of Republicans, at least ones who don't have to face elections. You've got lots of tough, smart business leaders. My God, you've even got your own home state universities who teach this stuff. And on the other side, what have you got? You've got a bunch of hired guns 
hiding behind phony front group masks funded with fossil fuel money that they try to hide. Who are you going to trust? Pope Francis or the oily secretive Koch brothers? Milton Friedman or fossil fuel hitman Grover Norquist? The International Monetary Fund or ExxonMobil, the company that has been caught out lying for decades about climate change, over and over again. Front groups who hide their donors. Isn't that a clue? Can we as a body, as a United States Senate, really not discern where the conflict of interest lies, where the record of lying lies? Look, the climate crisis is real, and it's accelerating. Bad as it is already, we're just in the opening credits. It's getting worse. The pages sitting here on the Senate floor know this. The rest of their lives will be spent coping with the consequences of our failure. The failure of the grown-ups. The sickening failure of the grown-ups. We have got to get going here. And look, we're trying to do it your way. Pretty much every Republican who has thought this climate problem through to a solution comes to the same place, the same place, a revenue-neutral, border-adjustable price on carbon. That's what we've offered. We can't come much further than that. We are reaching out. We are trying to do it your way. But the answer back can't be dictated by a fossil fuel industry that has spent billions to deny and obscure the facts, an industry that to this day fights from behind a facade of lies. I tell my Republican colleagues they have lied to you and lied to you, and you should cut them loose. We're all just back from the 4th of July. How about an Independence Day for the Republican Party from the rotten reign of the fossil fuel industry? Just cut them loose. Let's do the job we've been entrusted with as senators of the United States. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at the reality. Let's look at what our home state universities teach. Let's look at what business, real businesses in America are telling us. Let's do our job. And on our part, we have reached over as far as we know how. We know nothing more that we can offer than the terms that Republicans have proposed when they work this problem through to a solution. We've, hear, we're, we, we're, we've, hear, we've said yes. We've said yes. Is there really not one of you? Is there really not one of you who will reach back and start to solve this problem? I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.